All right, today Josh is with us uh, for the 52 special guests live in front of a studio audience for the second time. Thanks for having me again. Yes, uh, we're at Ref Reef of Palooza Dallas and this is 52 questions in 52 minutes. So I took all the questions that you guys have had about 52 series so far. Uh, they are all here. We're gonna answer them as fast as we can. We only got 52 minutes. We may not get through all of them. So I'm gonna go quick and starting right now, man, 52 minutes, we're going. All right, number one. Uh, at what point in the cycle do you begin adding pods and bacteria to these tanks? I'm going to ask him what he does, and then I'll give you a little bit of my own thing and how we're going to do it in these tanks. It's not all that far apart. So when we think about pods, we think about having a habitat capable of sustaining them. So we would make sure we're out of the ammonia stage beforehand. <clears throat> but bacteria straight away. I mean, you kind of want to get a good head start, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so for me in these tanks, I don't really overthink this, man. I, don't, I haven't found any like miracle timing on this. Uh, and in fact, if you started with live rock, I probably wouldn't bother with most of the bacteria mm -hmm. in the bottle. If you start with dry rock, I mean, I, I use Dr. Tim's in every single one of these tanks. I use it as directed on the bottle. I have no idea whether it works or not, other than it's been part of every successful tank I've done and it costs 10 bucks. So not worth the conversation, right? Yeah. Uh, we're also using Microbacter 7 on most of these things. Uh, and it's not because I know exactly what it's doing or not doing. I just know that it's part of most of my peers' successful tanks and it costs 10 bucks. Not worth the conversation, right? Uh, but if I was using like the tanks that, uh, uh, we started with uh, the Tampa Bay saltwater rock comes out of the ocean. Yeah, it's plug and play. That wouldn't do it. If I was buying rock from you guys, you have those big bins, so they'll take some dry rock and turn it into live rock by having it sit in those bins in his uh, place. I'm not buying pods there in that case. I'm probably not buying bacteria. I might buy the Dr. Tim's if I was going to add more than one fish or something like that. Uh, but is a miracle thing? I mean, I guess I would probably put the pods in you know, right before I turn the lights and stuff on, uh, you know, there has to be some kind of food in there. I'm not dosing phytoplankton and going through all that shenanigans because I am not going to do that perpetually mm -hmm. anyway. Uh, but there needs to be some kind of food in there. So about the time that I start feeding the fish and stuff, maybe like slightly after that, I would probably do it again if budget allows like a month later. Yeah, uh, you're looking at it as a cleanup crew. Yeah. More important with an SPS tank than an LPS tank. Uh, the LPS tank, the lights just aren't as bright and it doesn't fuel as many of the like diatoms and dinos and slimes and stuff that some of the cold pods eat. Uh, so, but in a tank that I'm like an insta tank or try to get an SPF tank fast up, yeah, dude, quick. That's way over two minutes. All right, next one. Uh, many people uh, still are, have, have commented on the Chromis tank. That we're gonna put like a hundred of these Chromis in a tank and then we're gonna add a uh, grouper in here, right? Will they disappear over time? What's response to all of these doubters? The, that's a good topic because Chromis, for most people do just kick the bucket, but they're also putting six or a dozen in a tank that's 60, 80 gallons with no real habitat, you know? So I'll give you an example. We, our 1500 gallon tank has on the left-hand side, one gigantic reef slope, mm -hmm. right? It's like a flat drop off. And there's acres that go out like this. They literally live there and they don't go anywhere else except for out to eat. But mm -hmm. we don't lose any of them, ever. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. for my experience is uh, uh, animals that aren't hungry are generally nice to each other. So a lot, often the times uh, when uh, they're not fed well, man, they'll start uh, picking each other off. Uh, when there's only a dozen of them, it's really easy to identify the one that looks different and they pick on that one. When there's uh, 60 of them, less so, you know, and it's, they're well fed. I don't think it's gonna be a problem. Also, ample habitat. If there's like one little acro in there, they're all trying to fight to be in, well, expect them to fight. Mm -hmm. If we take the time to set up a, a, a ample a, a habitat for all the acros in there, you know what? Probably not gonna be a problem. Uh, also, uranema, common problem with uh, chromis. I'm gonna get them from somebody uh, with marine collectors that's already treated for uranema because I don't wanna do that. You know, uh, so uh, in that case also, like, that's just somebody that I would probably like, I wouldn't go buy a fish off of his website because it's going to be astronomically expensive to do it that way. I'd reach out to him and tell him what you're trying to do yeah. and, and they probably would hook you up in some way. Uh, but like you would have to treat for those things and consider even if, them all. Even if they've just sat for a period of time, you know what I mean? If they've made it past that, you know, two month mark somewhere, then you know they're probably a good fish to begin with. Uh, definitely. So uh, also, the, will the grouper eat them all? 
All right. Uh, there's a couple of things that we can do to do that. We can make sure that we don't add the grouper until the chromis have all, you know, found their homes. Uh, we've grown enough homes for them. This isn't an insta tank. I don't need to add all of it once just to feel good. We're building a prog prog uh, doing progress here to build to, you know, an outcome, right? So we'll wait until there's ample uh, amount of places for these things to hide. Uh, we're also probably going to fudge, you know, the rules of what the size of a grouper is that goes in there. Because your instinct would be, you know, to put a small one in, right? Because it's going to fit in there, but the small one's going to be nimble. <laughs> and it's going to be able to go in there and find them. The bigger one won't be as nimble. But we have a lot of open space in this thing for it to fit, uh, swim around. And also, these are like pretty sedentary fish. You yeah, know, they don't get around much. They're not like darting all over the place looking for places. Like, you know, we built structure explicitly for it to do its natural behavior, which is like hang out underneath a ledge, you know? So uh, we're going to build all these things together. And beyond that, man, like we're not irresponsible. So, you know, if it doesn't go that way and you start eating them beyond like our, you know, what we thought was going to happen, we'll swap out the grouper with a different fish. You know, and something else that's equally as cool, but we'll all learn something from the experience. Either that we can totally do this, or hey, these are some challenges worth solving, you know, so anybody who wants to come and do this after we would know. Even some of that, um, like real reef branch rock would be a good solution too, right out oh. of the gate. Mm -hmm. uh, for, your, for reference point, what we're going to do is three different styles of acros on there. So uh, Eric over at, Marie, or at Route 66 is going to get us a big giant uh, you know, coral for it. We're also going to get some maricultured corals that you can grow out. And then one part of it, uh, Adam at Battle Corals, is going to cover it in the same type of frags. Uh, it's probably become more similar to how somebody would do it at home, actually. And then you'll get to see you know, how the three different approaches grow out and you know, what the chroma seed to prefer as well. Uh, on the next question, how many is how many chromis survive after one year the best measurement of success? <laughs> of course, you don't want to see your fish die. Mm -hmm. I mean, yeah, for sure. If a living fish, it, a living fish is always going to be a sign of su success. Same with coral. I, I just bring this one up because I, I, I mean, I picked out all these questions, but like, it is a question here of you think of success. When I say you, I mean us often as the end result. Does a tank look good? You know, does it impressive? When people come over, they say, holy cow, what did you, how'd you do that, right? Uh, and so that's part of it. But really the measurement of success is we have a bunch of animals in here we're trying to keep alive. You know, did you do that? Are they alive? You know, uh, if you killed them all, then probably not. So yes, I think that is a good measurement of success. Uh, are we all perfect? You know, uh, no. You know, like, would some of these animals get eaten in the wild? Absolutely. Sure. You know, so like that is just part of nature as well. Uh, number four, when in the cycle do you start the auto water changes? In this case, it doesn't need to be auto. It could be just manual water changes as well. Uh, when you get to the halfway to your target nutrient level or right out of the gate? Um, my call on that is any, any newer tank has a harder time breaking down. Um, organic so I would say pretty well out of the gate because you don't want to be fighting algae when you're just trying to deal with a new tank I mean you're still establishing your your husbandry processes you're still trying to create a routine that's gonna work for you why fight algae I think that question kind of gets to the end of like an old mentality of how do I do as little as possible mm. like I don't really want to do that water change until I absolutely have to like, like it was just like literally one water change in the beginning or we're, we're debating, just start doing them immediately. You know, whatever it, the, the, the thing that you're going to do long term, start doing it now, you know, uh, because also like waiting for nitrate and phosphate to go up ain't going to work, man, because all of the algae and slimes and stuff going to suck up all the nitrate and phosphate and be like, oh, I don't have any of that. But you got slime and algae everywhere. You know, it comes down to a plan, too. You know, if you're if you're going to throw corals in straight away, then yeah, you're feeling like, oh, it's stripped down. Why am I doing water changes? Mm -hmm. But then you didn't beat the original problem, which was letting your tank establish itself before going into it. There you go. Uh, okay, next one. How do you know when the ozone is working if you're running it for one hour a night when no one's there? Just for reference, what we're doing now is we're running ozone, like, you know, from like 1 a.m. to 2 a.m. The reason that I wouldn't use it in the past is, even though it worked really great for a lot of applications, is 
I don't really want the ozone in my house and I'm really not sure how safe it is for the animals or whatever. We've done a bunch of experiments and we've demonstrated that running at one hour a night ORP controlled to like 450, I think it's millivolts, uh, like an ORP controller, the water's crystal clear even after months. It is unidentifiable from brand new uh, water visually. All those organics are broken down. Like all of you guys are out there buying like, you know, low iron, iron glass and all that stuff, you know, spend a thousand dollars. Like this little thing, man, makes it clear all the time. No more carbon, no anything. And like for me and say for my household, using it at 1 a.m. for an hour, no big deal. But how do you know it's running at 1 a.m.? The objective is water clarity, right? I mean, I mean, literally, you're putting an ozone there. generator on to, to clarify your water. So if your water is clear or clearer than it has been, then I think that's the answer. That's the outcome. You know it's actually <laughs> working. Best way to look at that is through the side. You know, so if you look at through the side, the water should not be yellow or weirdly green uh, or continually get worse than that. And the, the yellowing pigments in the water will mix with the glass to create that ugly color. So it should be really, really clear, especially if you have low iron glass. And uh, you're, you're graphing your ORP too. So yep. you should be able to see the result in that. You should never use ozone without an ORP <clears throat> controller, not once. You don't need a, a fancy controller. You can go get like a little Milwaukee one and plug it into that thing. You know, I don't think those things are, they're like, last I checked, they're like less than a hundred bucks. Yeah, right I don't, around know, around. I don't know what they are now, but like it is not a super expensive thing. Plug it in, set it to 450, it's easy. Uh, you can put it on a digital timer of any kind and just have it go on for an hour a night. All right, uh, is there a list of ozone compatible skimmers? There probably is. Um, I would say the, the two things that are the most important would be the fact that the skimmer has Schedule 80 components and silicone. Mm -hmm. uh, I, if it doesn't say, if the manufacturer hasn't taken time to say, hey, I'm ozone ready, assume it's not, I guess. If you really, really want to use one of those, uh, reach out to those people and ask them, hey, is it, uh, or us, uh, or whoever you want to buy it from. Uh, but I'd say most of them actually say, like, have an old special ozone port dressed for them. Uh, Maxpect uh, didn't do that in the skimmers that we're using. So there, there's a couple of tubes and stuff that are not ozone safe. Uh, and what it does is it, like, breaks down the plastic and it mm -hmm. makes it all mushy. It's really weird, actually. It gets all gummy. It happens fast. Yeah. Uh, but they do have a little kit afterward. You know, you're going to replace those couple of fittings in the tubes. It takes two minutes and you replace it. But they made it special for that because, to be frank, man, how many of you here, in here run ozone? Yeah, one, two uh, out of a hundred. So that's why they didn't include those fittings uh, off the bat and charge you for them. But if you want to run them, you can add these couple of things. Uh, all right, Ben, gone a while. Wasn't there a series about Ryan building a huge tank in his basement? Common question. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Uh, yes, absolutely. That was the hardest, most painful tank that I ever built. Uh, and we talked about that uh, last night with a bunch of people. You know, it's so important to share your failures uh, as well as your successes, the challenges that you have. That was the hardest thing that I've ever gone through. It is now in my office and it will be part of one of the eight tanks that you'll see in this series. And so in a matter of a couple of weeks, you get to see exactly where that tank is at today. Uh, and it will no longer be part of the hardest part of my life. So uh, yes, that tank will be there. As a blanket uh, statement, why? Why did, why did you do away with it? <clears throat> Why did it go so hard? Yeah. Oh, man. Like, blanket statement. Blanket statement is, uh, I mean, I have two that some of you probably heard before. One is never set up the biggest tank of your life in the middle of COVID when you have uh, three children. Uh, one of them is about to be born. Uh, <laughs> you know, uh, you're running a business, like, like all these things in a brand new house, and you're doing it on camera in front of everybody. Like that tank is destined to be a failure. Uh, you know, like it was, it was, it was poor timing. Uh, but the other thing was, I would just say, generally, it was rushed. Yeah. You know, I was really trying to make an epic video series rather than an epic tank. You know, and so it gets down to your priorities and stuff. And also, you cannot ensure any outcome. What I really learned out of this, I've set so many tanks up, and most of them are really awesome, and sometimes it's not. You know, and in reefing, there's so many weird things that are happening in this tank. We can do things that make decisions that like, like make a much more likely outcome or a increase the chances of a bad outcome. But we can't guarantee one or the other. And if you set up 10 tanks, you 100% universal agreement. Mm. Yeah, like you will see that there's always a surprise in here once in a while. If you stick to the original plan and you built everything around to the plan, 
chances are you'll be successful more if you stick to it and don't veer off. The other part of this is so many of the rules that apply to Insta tanks and doing it fast on a LPS tank, which is really easy, don't apply to a SPS tank where the lights are super bright and uh, are going to grow all the uglies really rapidly. All the photosynthetic pests win really fast in a brand new tank. So lots of these lower light LPS tanks, super duper easy. The rules that apply to that tank don't apply to a light that's just getting pounded in light mm -hmm. tank. All right, next one. Question, if you're running a, f a Fowler system, why use Pro Reef? And I think like our, uh, our Predator tank is the one this came off of. Uh, seems like an overkill in the cost department versus Red Sea Blue Bucket or Instant Ocean uh, when you're not trying to support coral growth. So more or less the question is, why use an expensive salt on a tank with an eel and some, har and some uh, uh, lionfish and some other fish in it? I think, you know, going back to the purpose of the of the tank, that's going to be driving my decision on what salt we use. You know, if I'm if I'm trying to stay away from paying a million dollars on a different type of salt when I already have a certain type of salt, I would stick with it. If I don't want to clean the containers and I want to have a nice clean container or pay somebody to do it, then I'll go with a better salt. But otherwise, I mean, salt is salt. So that's two the two reasons are the same as here for me. Like for me, it's, it's use whatever it is that you've been most successful with. We use the Tropic Marine Pro Reef for I, I don't even know how many years now. Even during their like weird little turkey debacle, man, I didn't even know about it. We'd been using it for months, you know. Uh, and the only reason we knew about it is because like afterward, all of a sudden these bins that were used to stay clean all the time are now dirty. Uh, tanks didn't notice it. I don't know. Yeah, you know, like uh, so we continue to use it, and I just this is stuff what I use. So like I would suggest, I don't care what salt you use, stop talking about salt because it really doesn't even matter. Like uh, just use the one that you think. Uh, for me, the cost of the salt, the bucket, whether it's 60 bucks or 100 bucks, sounds like a lot, but most tanks use about this much and it's like $4 a month one way or another. It really doesn't matter all that much, you know? Uh, in our case, to be frank, if we're just talking about cost, it costs more for me to pay people to clean out the bins than it does to use the salt that doesn't put garbage in the bins. So answer there uh, is uh, real simple. It's, it's the, probably the least important choice you'll ever make is what salt you use. To uh, add to that super quick, I think being proactive and keeping the, the organics down in the tank is probably more cost effective than picking a better salt. There's eight million ways you could, uh, pollutants that could go in the tank from eight million different things. Uh -huh. The salt entrance of it is probably the least important, I agree 100%. <clears throat> uh, all right, the lighting is sweet. This is the Predator tank. Uh, what's the color spectrum you went with on the Predator tank? I, sh I shared with you earlier, what do you think? It's a really light, or a dark, dark blue. I think it's super cool, the way that you have that, that focal um, light source. As long as you can see the fish, amen, pick whatever. So this is a display. You know, you think about like how I want to like, I'm not just keeping an eel, you know? I want to create something that's visually impressive in the house. You know, when people come over, they're like, ah, that's cool. You know, mm -hmm. that's like, I think that's like a, my measurement of whether I did it right. <laughs> it's how many times I hear that, you know? And so when you, when you go up and see it, I just want to like light the tank. So what we did is we tried to create that twilight effect. We used black sand, even though I would normally never use black sand. It worked exactly the way I wanted. Instead of being bright, it's kind of dark and spooky and eerie in there. And then we used the Kessel lights to create those kind of beams. Uh, and then we used on top of that, the little like magnetic reflectors that go on to the bottom of it to focus the light down into beams that focus right on top of each one of the aquascapes. So you can kind of see this twinkling thing going on the pieces of the aquascape but then in between it's really dark and it creates this really kind of powerful visual appeal and you're right like once all the fish are in there I may tune the whiteness uh, up or down to make sure the color of the fish actually comes mm -hmm. through uh, because I don't want it just to be overpoweringly blue but it will still be probably dim and have that sparkle twinkle thing to it so in this case I get to design something not about photosynthetics but thinking about like what looks the pot the coolest possible thing you could do in a tank and you know part of that is like that's the beauty of that that style of tank is it's like it's so little effort you know you can put like a lot of effort in building it but in the end man you got these really cool fish in there and i'm not dealing with all the chemistry issues mm -hmm. or whatever but i just want it to be equally as impressive in a totally different way 
Well, when something's purpose built, execution's everything. You yeah. Know? So the, a light like that, that showcases the, the different rock structures beneath the beam. I think you did a good job. It reminded me, I think I, I, in my mind, I stole it from the zoo. You know, like, like you go to the zoo and you can think of how they use lights to focus in a display in a place where you went to go look at a display. You know, and I don't know, I can't think of one specific that I borrowed that from, but like, that's the way I even think of it in my head is when they're building these displays in the zoos and public aquariums, like they're making it to look impressive, you know, regardless of what's in it. Uh, something I'm happy to see is the tanks are designed for habitat, not cost. I know these tanks are all pricey, but I'm happy to see it done right with a realistic cost up front. Now this isn't really a question, but it's a comment that comes up over and over and over again is, what we're doing here is not cheap. This is not the cheapest possible way to do it. But we're trying to think about how these animals live in the wild and then build to that and build something cool. Yeah, I think, I think if you're expecting a certain amount of money up front, I mean, you can almost always double it. You know, because you're gonna tinker, you're gonna wish you did something different. You're gonna upgrade where you didn't think you wanted to upgrade. I mean, cost for sure is a big factor in this hobby, but it's not cheap. You know, on the softy one, I saw a comment that specifically said, I hope that no new reefer comes across this tank because they'll get stare scared away. And like, they're not wrong, you know? Like, but the answer that I'm thinking of is like, Whoever watched this that thought this was for beginners, man, I think missed it. You know, like this, this is not a beginner's tank. You know, like we're, we're way beyond that. And yes, it's true. Like we could tell you how the easy way to do it in the beginning. But to me, that's akin, like if I was looking for uh, how to do bake French pastries, you know, on YouTube on that. And then it opened up and they're like, all right, so we're going to build these awesome French pastries. Uh, but if you want to do it really easy, there's this Pillsbury, you know, like a tube of croissants. <laughs> well, that seems awfully strange, man. Like, uh, so we're not doing that here. The people in this room, man, are not looking for to do this for the very first time. You know, there is a cost to it. And each one of these budgets, you know which piece of this thing is most valuable to you and how to ba uh, balance to it and complexity as well. I shared with you earlier, you know, I've, I've built stuff from scratch thinking I was going to save money. And while it was fun, I learned a lot along the way. I mean, I probably spent more than if I'd have just done it the right Right, the first time. If you know a way you want to do it already, and then you make sacrifices, <clears throat> it just doubled the cost because you're going to buy the other thing later. Guaranteed. Yep. Uh, <laughs> like, I've, I've done it so many times. You but know? it's a tinkering hobby too. Yeah, it's, it's true. Uh, I, the amount of times I've bought in three things uh, you know, in the progression to get to where I thought I wanted to be. If I had just foregoed something else entirely, just said, hey, I don't need that thing right now. I'm just gonna get the right thing here uh, and benefit me the right way. I'd be way, way happier. Uh, all right, so uh, you started, you're doing heavy feeding, high par. Why no fleece filter on the Chromis tank? Why no fleece filter on the Chromis tank? I'll save you the feature. Yeah, it doesn't have a place know. for it. It's got filter socks in the sump, right? So I just like, I would like to in the beginning, you know, f take the stuff out of there because it's just easier. If, if you had a spot for it, I'd probably do it. But like, am I gonna jerry rig, you know, a place or buy these things that are hard to use and stuff and try to fit it into a place it doesn't really go and then take it off in 12 months? We talked about it yesterday. If you don't need it, why? Yeah. So if you gave me a really easy way to do it and it was affordable and I was going to make my next 12 months a lot easier, sure. Dude, but if it's not there, I like, dude, it's just one piece of filtration. There's all these different ways to approach it. Just like you bought the sump, you bought the tank, it has that sump, just figure out the right way to do it. This is not a necessary piece to it. You could change out the filter socks if you wanted to uh, for the next year. Me, I'm just going to up a piece of my game somewhere else, probably with the refugium. And I don't even think that's going to be really a heavy end tank. It will be when I'm feeding 100 fish uh, when they're all in there. But uh, I, when I add the fish, is a different story too, you know. Mm -hmm. And I'll be frank too. Like when we turn the lights on in this tank, you know, it's heavy light. You know, there's 300 par blanketing every aspect of this entire tank. We turn it on, and uh, algae. You know, this is the this is the TBS rock came out of the ocean. Guess what? There's algae in the ocean. So mm -hmm. we turn on the lights. Okay, the most astounding thing happened. You are the first person I think introduced it to me to the concept of 
uh, utilitarian fish, mm -hmm. right? So I knew that tangs, tangs eat algae and stuff, but I hadn't really thought about them in that aspect of they have a job in the tank, <coughs> put them in there, they eat algae for a living. Okay, it was the most astounding thing. Call Elliot, like, hey man, do I need these fish? I need the, the uh, uh, algae eating fish because the thing's getting overrun with algae. We dropped in a uh, orange uh, shoulder tang mm -hmm. and an asso tang, dude. Over the weekend, came back, all gone. Problem solved. Uh, it was done. You know, and like I didn't even think the orange shoulder tang was actually particularly good at that. Eat those words certainly was. Uh, you make a good point, though. I mean, coral and, and and algae grow in the same exact environment. Yeah, all the stuff that's coming out, the good stuff and the bad stuff, and it isn't even really bad because it's food for the fish. You know, it's just bad when it gets out of control. Uh, if there if there are any effects of microplastics uh, emanating from our equipment. Uh, that's something I often wonder about. So uh, we're putting all this plastic gear and magnets and everything in the tank. Is that going to build up, not in a day, but over the course of the next five years? In your tank? Mm -hmm. yeah, all these plastics degrading, you know, they're not perfect. It's hard to say. I mean, I would expect that any kind of particulate like that is going to make its way through a skimmer, mm -hmm. right? Or if you're using a fleece roller or who knows? It's hard to say. Answer. Don't know. Would assume so. I would assume something's coming out of the plastic. Mm. Uh, water is like what they call the, the ultimate solvent or something like that, a universal mm. solvent. Put something in water, some of that thing's going in the water, uh, for sure. Over the course of five years, for sure. We've all seen magnets explode. You've seen all the different things that can happen in there. So that's, for me, people just keep talking and talking and talking about how to avoid water changes. This is how, like, I just don't have to have the conversation anymore. I don't have to worry about microplastics or whatever, because if I do my 10% water change every week or 1.5% daily or 35-ish percent uh, monthly, every six months or so, I turn out all the water. Like, so these weird conversations about plastics and stuff, I don't have to think about that. I don't have to decide whether or not that's going to build up in my tank. It's just gone. The 8 million different things that go along with that, that I will make a mistake of or not aware of or mismanaged in some way, not issue in my tank, because I just managed that, but I decided to do the, the water change. Now, when I decided, like, oh, I really want to get around that, and if anybody's watched the ULM series, you've certainly seen me buy into that, you know? Uh, I bought out, you know? I just really wanted it to be easy. I really wanted to use a test kit to tell me when to change the water just didn't turn out that way for me. Uh, so you can follow that if you want. My experience is this. It works until it doesn't, yep. you know? And those people aren't here to tell you about it. You know, only the people that are around to tell you about it is the people who tell you how great it is. The people where that thing, that no water change system failed, that tank is gone, and those people are no longer talking about it on the forums. You know, it just doesn't exist. It's always going to be a conversation anytime you cut a corner. Uh, ah. Would it be a good idea to try using filter feeders or clams as an alternative filtration? Yeah, you use um, refugiums readily, right? So okay. there's always options. Well, they're saying filter feeders or clams. A bivalve. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I'm sure John's going to chime in on that. I'm sure he's going to like yeah. that. Uh, here's the thing. I've always wanted to do that. <laughs> Hey, you want a protein skimmer? Or how about we set up a little tank that's a look down tank next to it that's filled with uh, beautiful clams filtering the water for you? Which one of those do you want to maintain? I, I have no idea whether or not it would work or not, you know, but wouldn't that be cool when your, uh, your neighbor comes over and they're like, why you got all those clams? Like, oh, that's my filter. <laughs> why are they so beautiful? Uh, I have heard lots of anecdotal, I've never done it. Mm -hmm. Anecdotal, people putting like oysters and stuff in like a cryptic sump or something like that. And all the bivalves pull out a, a, a lot of the waste out of the tank. Uh, I've never done it. Yeah, I've seen studies where they do it offshore, mm -hmm. you know, but it's not my realm. I can't even speak to it. Sure would be cool. Uh, I'd love to try it. Yeah. Uh, you mentioned experiment with the pods that were set up a while ago. Do you have any news on the final conclusion of that video series set up? I'll answer this one. This was the, the biome series. So we tracked all these tanks and did the biome series. We talked about doing a, like a follow-up to it. And, you know, frankly, man, we just never got around to setting all those tanks up. 52 weeks of reefing SE came along, and we just started putting effort in that. But the answer is we took all the things that we learned from that series, and now we're building them into different eight tanks. So. One of the questions is, could we learn more about the biome series and you know, looking at this from an analytic point of view? 
Uh, well, yeah, but would you rather just see eight tanks tank the things that we learned from that and produce a reproducible method of setting up a tank without a headache? Because I think that's really what we're getting at. And so that's what we're doing here with uh, uh, all of the tanks that we're setting up, is trying to take the things we've learned and apply them to what really actually matters, which is the tank. Will we ever come back and do Biome 2? When there's it, Apple time. I think that's probably one of my favorite topics that you bring up because it kind of reaffirms the whole idea that our super established live rock is somehow responsible for our success. Mm -hmm. You know, and, and it's it's super true. You know, I shared with you a long time ago that when you set up a brand new tank and you've got all that brown film algae on the tank and you take one piece of live rock and stick it right in the middle of it, the next day there's a super clean ring around it. And then the next day a bigger ring and then the next day a bigger ring, you know, that supports every bit of that. So this is a, a, a hobby. We learn more every day <clears throat> and we react to yesterday's problem. Most of the time we overreact, you know, and we have the pendulum and we go back and forth. And so for me, I set up all my first tanks and I had all kinds of weird pest problems. And so, you know, dry rock showed up. And so I decided like, oh, I'll just avoid all those problems. And I won't have Aptasia and I won't have these weird isopods and stuff and whatever. And then like, as long as I was doing an LPS tank, that was just fine. And then I tried to apply that to an SPS tank. And then all of a sudden I had like explosive dinos. And so somebody was talking to me yesterday about like what causes dinos. And like, why is it suddenly like been this thing in the last you know ten years, and it was never a thing really before that? Mm -hmm. I would say it was a couple of different things. And my guess, because nobody really knows why that would be, but you have to look to the things that have changed in the last uh, ten years. One, man, we've changed uh, the way that we light our tanks. Two, uh, we have changed to a lot more people doing SPS tanks with super high powered uh, lighting than we used to. We've made that accessible now, and so and definitely that. Like when you triple the amount of light that's pounding those things, you triple the amount of those cells replicating. You know, they, they, those dinos and uh, diatoms just take over the tank. Also though, we went to dry rock, you know? And so some probably combination of that thing, we created this sterile tank and then we start it right away. We pound it with light and the most opportunistic organism in there that has no competitors just takes off. Mm -hmm. And then never gets really, and just, nothing can ever like catch up back up to it. So like for me, the w number one thing was just turn the damn lights off. You know, turn it off, let the other things catch up, turn the lights back on, don't add corals until that cycle has figured itself out. Yeah, spend, spend the extra money or time, however you wanna look at it, and put good live rock in your tank, even if it means getting some you know, dry Marco, establishing it, establishing it in some reef tank or with whatever process you feel necessary, and then use it because it's definitely gonna ensure your success. Uh, next one, could you share the wave maker settings the same way you do for lights? I won't do that ever. I mean, I can give you a theory because there's no two tanks that are gonna flow the same, not at all. Yep, that's exactly why. So a lot of people are like, all right, well, we're gonna set it up this way, you know, at 80%, you know, and have this setting and whatever, like, it's garbage, man, because 100%, 100 dude, once it's going, I'm gonna change it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I, it's like best laid plants, you know? You think that the water's gonna work a certain way, and the way that I check it usually is I just blow some bubbles through a tube into it and I kinda watch where they go or sprinkle some food in there and kinda watch where it settles out. And like, no, nope, didn't work exactly the way I thought every time. You know, every time you're like, this could be done a little bit better mm -hmm. if we did X. And so a better question will be like watching how it evolves and when we land there, what does that look like? not applicable to any of you unless you built your aquascape that looks identical to mine. The lessons that uh, you learn from it are absolutely applicable. The thought process that went into like, I tried to solve X because of Y, that you can reapply to your own tank intelligently, but you can't like emulate this. It's not lighting. Lighting would be like, get to 300 par with the spectrum looks like this, done, right. leave it alone, it's over. You're looking for an outcome, yeah. you know, and that outcome is always gonna be, get the stuff up off the bottom or get it out of your rocks and make sure that everything's moving and maybe not too much. There you go. Can you share your flow rate for your UV? No, the manufacturer will do that for you. Yeah, I, I, there's no, I don't know anything magic about UV more than the manufacturer knows about its own product. I will tell you for some reason they differ. You know, so the uh, uh, ones from Emperor Aquatics require or suggest way higher, way lower flow rate in relation to uh, the amount of UV. 
So the, the dose is higher. Uh, the ones from uh, the Aqua Ultraviolet yep. uh, you know, suggest less dose of UV to achieve the same result. I haven't personally experienced a major difference between the two, uh, but if I were doing it, I generally go bigger than required because I do not measure the flow rate all the time. And I don't really want to install a flow meter and maintain that thing anymore. And so in our case, what we did is we installed 57 watt ones that are like high output from Aqua Ultraviolet because they're about this big and you can actually just sand them right up in the sump. Yeah, that's you know, put a nice. pump in the bottom and it comes back, uh, uh, goes back up out. It, it is really easy to install and it's rated for tanks that are you know, triple the size of this. And I just use a flow rate that is real somewhere in the middle. So no matter what, it's fine. Right. Yeah, they they have volumetric efficiency figured out. We don't. Yeah, so that would be my own personal take on it. Uh, but I, I would I would look to the people that make these things for a living. Uh, when you say you're going to retire the reef mat filter on the LPS tank, you mean to say that you don't plan to use any mechanical filtration after the first to 12 to 18 months, or will you replace it with filter socks? We talked about this yesterday a little bit. That's you. Okay. Uh, yeah, I'm only using the filter on the LPS tank. I'm only using the roller mat because there's a spot for it, super easy to install, and uh, when there's tons of coral in there that have, want those organics and they'll feed on them and filter my tank for me, I'm gonna pull that thing out and I'm not replacing with filter socks. You will in fact never ever once see me use filter socks because I will not replace them every three days. My lifestyle uh, does not fit that. Uh, and so if it does, it's a really great solution for pulling out organics, especially if you're having too many and it's causing problems in your tank. Uh, when you see an update video, oh, when will we see an update video on the Chromis tank? Uh, other, unlike 52 weeks of reefing last time, where you just kind of like periodically saw updates, what we're planning in the future will look something like this. It will look like science episode. So let's learn everything we can possibly learn about this aspect of science. It's going to get way nerdier than you're prepared for. Uh, then the <laughs> next episode will be tools of the trade. Like how do I actually apply that knowledge, you know, using the available tools, you know, like, you know, the different types of plumbing or lighting or pumps or chemistry solutions, whatever it might be. And then after that, let's do one of these, what we're doing right now, it's bringing another expert. Let's talk to them, their knowledge, have them come into the, uh, because the more you learn from the more variety of people, the better, not just hearing it from me and BRS TV. And then we'll do an update on the tanks. Updates on the tanks should look something like, here is the Chromis tank, we've added these corals, I ran into these problems and we solved it like X. I probably won't tell you what's going right all that much because we already planned on that. You know, uh, what we learn from mostly is the mistakes. And I'll tell you one of our most popular video series we've ever done has definitely been the mistake series because I don't really want all your dumb tips, I want to know where you failed and I don't want to fail like you did. <laughs> Uh, all right. Uh, do you think an airstone is overlooked as, uh, as a, a long power outage option? Maybe for fish, but not with coral. I mean, coral need to off gas. They got to get that slime off of their skin. There has to be water movement. I think yeah. an airstone is just not the answer. Airstone is like a visual thing because you <clears> see <throat> these little bubbles going up to the top. It must be adding oxygen to it. But really what's happening is, is like there's a gas exchange around that bubble, mm -hmm. right? Okay, imagine now instead of just how much bad gas exchange must be around that bubble. Well, now imagine a power head aimed at the top of the tank and the whole surface of that tank turning over. It's so much more and the pump is distributing that water throughout the tank as well, not in this little stream of bubbles right here. And on top of that, I would have to clean that thing. And I have to have a tube with a the air stone on it dangling in my tank 24 seven or like I get added during a pack. In the end, not a really great option. And Better has, than zero? Sure. It, yeah, it says long term, no. No, mm. I, I, would, I would not use this. A power head on any battery backup solution is way, way, way better solution uh, than <laughs> that like to the nth degree. Uh, wait a minute, where was week four? This is week four, not really week four, but uh, uh, we skip, we're gonna go through these again every month and we're gonna add in uh, having special guests in here share their knowledge and stuff so it's not just BRS TV. Uh, uh, another truly amazing video and valuable asset for the hobby. The only point of departure for me involves a comparison of feeding captive fish with the dietary habits of wild specimens. 
Meaning basically this person doesn't believe that we should think about what they eat in the wild and whatever we're doing is just working. Yeah, I, I mean, it really depends on the type of fish. You know, we, we've talked about the, the whole anthias thing a bunch of times now. I mean, they need to be fed. So if, if you can't feed uh, a super rich food like a pellet in your system over and over and over again, then that's not the right dietary need, mm -hmm. right? But a clownfish, for example, you could feed a couple of pellets here and there and it's more than enough for them. There's a big giant circle of fish. They'll just do fine uh, <coughs> with uh, only feeding uh, mice, shrimp, and pellets. That's a lot of fish. Those are all the fish we call easy, right? Uh, and then there's a big chunk of fish that like don't do really well. You know, there's something about it. It's probably a really good chance that dietary uh, thing is part of it. And then there's a chunk of fish that just always die, called expert only. Yes, diet is absolutely part of it. In fact, fish don't just die. We did something with habitat, we did something wrong with parasites, we did something wrong with aggression, or we did something wrong with diet. Figure out which one of those things is and solve, and it's no longer expert only, it's just do this. It's simple. So uh, there are fish that out there that we are not feeding correctly. We're feeding them super higher carbohydrate, uh, high fiber diets when they're used to eating protein only, or we're feeding them only protein when they're super used to using only carbohydrate and fiber diets. It affects every animal on the planet, assuming that like all fish in our tanks will all eat the same. And the reason that it feels that way is because malnutrition takes a long time to affect. So it may die in a year. And meanwhile, you're like, well, it wasn't the food. I've been feeding it that for a year. No, it just took a year to kill it. Right. So uh, it, we, there's lessons to learn. And we just need to identify what falls outside of the circle. Circle of safe and the circle of let's learn more. And your system has to support it. Uh, can I ask what substrate you, you uh, have used? It looks like it will be up to the task of taking higher flow without blowing around in the acro tank. Uh, that is sand from uh, Tampa Bay saltwater. Uh, this is sand I think that comes out of the ocean. It looks like that and it, it is just covered in life and it's just like chunky. It's like flaky chunky. It does not blow around. I think I would start every acro tank with this at that point if you're going to use sand. It is absolutely going to collect detritus, and you'll absolutely have to find livestock uh, to clean it or take up little parts of uh, cleaning it, small patches uh, periodically. But the stuff does not blow around. And I believe if I'm going to start a cycle in a brand new tank, the sand is probably a bigger part of the biome than the rock itself. Mm -hmm. And the other key factor to that, that one particular product, it's flakes. So they have to flop so they're not granular, they don't roll. Mm -hmm. So the movement of water is like, I mean, hand over fist, it, it's way stronger capable. Okay, and for some <laughs> reason, like we all think of the best looking tank must be the like the Bahama looking, you know, oolite sand. That's just a color though, no? Yeah, it, it does have this like, it has a look of like a beach. Like if I was like gonna mm -hmm. run around and I might put my feet in it, it looks great. I don't know, it doesn't really look like any reef I've actually snorkeled in. Mm. Right? And so almost all the people that have come here and seen the tanks in person are like, what is that sand? It looks really cool. It's filled with shells and stuff. And I think some of it is just our mentality of like, we've decided something looks good uh, when it doesn't. Mm. Uh, personally, like, I would buy the sand from TBS personally. Mm -hmm. uh, I, for a, definitely for an SPS tank. And super definitely if I was using dry rock and I didn't want to cycle this tank forever. And I, it's just a great way to add whatever that magic biome thing is from the ocean that we'll never really figure out in its entirety, but we can figure out solutions that work almost all the time. You know? uh, and you're gonna see that in one of these tanks in the, in the Magnifica anemone tank. It's all dry rock and just their sand. And so, so you'll see the outcome of that. You ever have the opportunity to use the uh, calcium reactor media? I have not. No, you should play around with that. It's, okay. it's cool because there's like this whole layer of living stuff that you can see through the glass underneath. Oh, really? Like an ant farm? Mm-hmm. <laughs> <laughs> I had that in my first take when I saw the, the, the uh, Watchman Gobi and the pistol shrimp, you know, build it up against the glass and it was like a little ant farm on the side. But you see that when you have, it's bigger, chunky stuff. Mm -hmm. You know, they create that and they can't really create it in, in the oolite as well. Yeah. Uh, all right. Uh, oh. What is the lighting setup used in this system? I would love to emulate it. In my case, all it is, man, is I just want a spotlight that creates a shimmer in the tank that doesn't look like a disco, it doesn't look like a TV static, and it doesn't whatever. The, the, uh, the Kessels do that for me. The blade lights are really thin and elegant, and so they look good. And for me, I'm showing this guys on camera, 
it needs to look good, you know? Uh, it's mounted to the wall with the, the Kessel brackets and this like little thin strip from AI. And I just want fill light. Like, you could never get me off of this. The fill light is how we get, you know, the photons to the animal, mm -hmm. right? And like PAR is, if, like what we're measuring is photons per square meter, you know, per second or something like that, right? So we're just counting photons here. All right, what happens, man, over a square meter if I cover up half of it? You got half the par. Your meter won't measure that, man, because it's only measuring an average of that and a teeny little, you know, size of the eraser. But when I block half of it, man, that coral's getting half the nutrition. End of story. And so this is the biggest part that, like, the little modular lights, especially the ones that are, like, super focused to get the best par meters, you know, because of par wars, worst thing that ever happened to our hobby because they look visually to the human eye really elegant on the top of the tank and they don't they look pretty even in the tank but biologically worst thing that ever happened to our hobby is we shifted it away from that but man are they really easy to stock on the shelves man are they really easy to ship and man does everybody really want something super light and easy to mount on the tank totally forgot about biology so uh, we solved that with fill light. You could do that with T5s. You can also do it with the modules now that everybody understands that we want to make them as wide as humanly possible. Form factor probably shouldn't be the size of a nickel. It can be about yay big. And then reflect off the glass, reflect off the sand. Get as many wide angle reflections. Maintain that easy to mount elegance on there. But for me, I know I want a blanket of light across the top. Mm -hmm. I think I've learned some of this from you. Yeah, I mean, we, we don't, and all of our systems use a ton of blanket lighting, but it's very specific to the environment too. You know, our display tanks have as much light as we can pack into one space. You know, for that reason, we turn the lights down. They don't get so hot. You know, the, the fact that we're covering the tank with almost unanimous fill light, as you say, I mean, it, it just works. So when you say blanket of light, blanket of light is just like, it could look literally like a bank of T5s, it's obvious a blanket of light. It could look like two Kessels with some strips on it or T5s on it. But like what you're saying is still a blanket of light because when you take a module and then like the way that you're told or they're sold to you is use one every two feet, right? Okay, well, that's just because nobody wants you to get sticker shock. Yeah. But like it doing you a disservice because what you really want is they're like, how many to achieve my goal? I want to grow coral. And I want them to grow big. I want them to be beautiful. I want them to be colorful. Just tell me how many. Don't lie to me, right? Uh, and so in this case, what you guys are doing is you're putting them like either as really dense or really high up, which mm -hmm. eliminates shadows in a grid, you know, in a tank though, you know, you start getting them every 18 inches, probably pretty good. But as the like, things get really big, you know, getting closer to like every 14 inches mm -hmm. or 12 or whatever. So it's still just four modules on there and it is a blanket of light. It's just created in a different way. You see the, the worst usage of these, these products are like, uh, a tank that's four feet long and there's two AI primes. Mm -hmm. And you've got this area beneath the, the prime where it does really good, but then outside of that, it's nothing. Especially, and the, the biggest falsehood then is, is it works really great when the frags are all small. Yeah. And then when they grow big, it doesn't. But it feels like it must have been the right solution because it's worked for the last mm -hmm. year. No, it's not. It's not the right solution for year two and three. Uh, and like, this is one of those things where I just like, we just like stop this conversation and move on because it's holding so many people back. The blanket of light and solving the shadow is one of the biggest problems. And it's probably just because it looks elegant and it's easy to stock and put on shelves and buy and mount. It's just the AI all blade, the wrong reasons. Nothing about the animal. The AI blade was a really good solution to that. I, I agree. I was pretty excited by the one I saw it. Mm -hmm. you know? So uh, it's a solution to the T5 bulb that people don't want to install old technology and they want it to be thin and elegant. And that's a solution to that. Uh, what about running a separate air pump on a return chamber to promote oxygen? In the return chamber, you're going to get a ton of micro bubbles in the tank. And that's, yeah. for me, that is annoying. It's and not only that, but the, it'll stick to the corals. It'll form those pockets underneath the rock and eventually burp out. It's just not practical. I, mean, I didn't think about this, but like, uh, what about like people do this like, bubble the air washing injection. or yeah, whatever yeah. bubble yeah, yeah. what's it called micro scrubbing bubbles uh scrubbing bubble mm -hmm. yeah has anybody ever done this have you done this yeah what did you get out of it it does help to get the stuff to the surface okay but i mean you can't do it you can't do it as a 
as this a practical solution. This is like a solution. skimmer pump or something in your return pump to yeah. intentionally put tons of bubbles into the tank and supposedly like wash the corals off. But it does, it does, but you can only do it overnight. Okay. You know. So would you do it, recommend it to anybody, do it on your own? It's a pain in the butt. It makes a ton of salt spray everywhere. You gotta set up a pump that's temporary overnight. I mean, there's other ways to skin a cat. I feel this to me very intriguing, not gonna do it. Yeah. I'd like you know, all I say is like making a mess. Uh, that said, open-minded, would love to try it. And it might be one of those things where I tried it and said, oh man, I missed the boat, this is so great. Never try it, but interesting. interesting if, you have, if you have dinos and you do it, if you really pump the tank full of like super dense bubbles, it gets it all to the surface and down on Really, the dinos? Mm -hmm. Interesting, learn something new every day. Okay, uh, next one. How many pounds of live rock and sand were added to this system? This is uh, the SPS systems with the, the Tampa Bay saltwater. So one of the things here is it comes with a lot of rock when you order the, like, their packages and stuff. Uh, my style of aquascaping like does not use all of that rock. You know, So uh, I think that I use probably maybe half a pound of rock per gallon of water. But the trick in that is that I wouldn't have been able to do that unless you ship me probably a pound and a half per gallon of water because I use very select pieces to create a very specific desired uh, design in my mm -hmm. tank. And now the other you know hundreds of pounds are sitting in a bin waiting for something else in the future, you know, in a, in a water bin uh, cycling. So that is a real, as a hobbyist, that is a really tough pill to swallow. I'm gonna order 150 pounds of rock and to I use. use it. 50, I don't know how to get over that, but internally you have to decide, do I want to create something like that's really epic at, in the beginning uh, and has very specific desires out of it? And if that's the case, you're gonna to have to do that, right? Now you were right from yesterday, it's gonna get covered in coral in the future if you do this right anyway, so maybe it doesn't matter to you. you yeah, we, we use a little bit more. We're like 0.75 for a gallon. But yeah, to your point, you always have to get a lot more than you actually need. Dude, I mean, all my aquascapes, dude, especially the dry ones, I go in the back and I pull out of 4,000 pounds all the pieces I want. You know, like, is that, like if I, you ship me only the box, that, that the, only the 100 pounds I need would not be look very uh, good on camera. To be it's honest. like doing a puzzle. What do you do? You spread them all out on the table, right? Mm -hmm. Uh, Dave here is one of the camera. He's down there with me all the time. Like we're breaking the stuff apart, you know. And some of it, like it just doesn't break the way you want it. Mm -hmm. I mean, like oh, this is rubble for something in the future. Yeah, uh, it isn't what we're going to use here. Uh, next one: Does Adaptive Reef sell those tablet boards? It was custom made for BRS. So uh, one of the things you'll see in the series is like little tablet boards everywhere, uh, and it has uh, like your control of your like apex. And there we go. Uh, we got. I'm going to give it eight minutes. Uh, uh, we got eight bonus minutes here. It was 52 minutes, but we got more questions here. So uh, there's a little tablet here that you know gives you control over that you can do your feed modes and all that stuff. And then down below, there like there's a the adaptive reef little switch box has four little momentary buttons and a couple of switches on it. You know, uh, I asked them to make that for us. Uh, it was cool enough that they made it for you guys too. So if you want to do that, some of the cool parts of it is I can just walk up to my tank and see the temperature in a way that I don't have to like put my head down underneath the sump and go find where the temperature is. Uh, the little switch box things. It is really cool for me personally to be able to walk up there. The one thing I love most about it is to be able to flip that switch and turn every single 24 plugs on this system off at once. Mm -hmm. And then turn them all back on again. Instead of toggling them all in my apex or pulling them all out of this, you know, the outlets or whatever. Uh, yeah, you would definitely have to learn how to code it. It's called if switch open then off. Lie, add that line of code to everything, and then you're done. Uh, uh, if nobody told you, it would be hard. Now that you know, uh, I don't know, not hard. Uh, next one. Uh, does what is off the shelf tablet does Neptune and BRS recommend for the Apex display? Uh, so they recommend the uh, like an iPad because it works with the app the best. In my case, if I bought eight iPads for that, I'd be in trouble. So uh, I used Amazon Fires. That's uh, so cheap. Yeah, I use refurbished Amazon Fires, the the tents, you know, and then they have like a browser called uh, Silk or something. I forget. Mm -hmm. I think that's right. Okay, uh, and so it's just a browser that's opened up in there. Uh, if you go and touch the serial number in the menu system five times or something like that, it will open, unlock the uh, the developer mode in which you can t tell it to not turn off ever again, uh, and if, as long as it's plugged in, I don't you know. know. That. 
Yeah, so now you learn something new. That was like 80 bucks, and now I have this really cool display next to the tank, and I have access to turn off stuff. It's pretty cool. Uh, all right, I'm curious why they went with dosing as opposed to a calcium reactor. Oh, there you go. Think of the SPS tanks. Yeah, calcium reactor is usually for a very demanding system. Like you how big? 100 plus gallons. Uh, for me, it, I've had them. I have them running on uh, the 360 for a big chunk of the time. I had them running underneath the tank on the, the 750 XL. They take up a lot of space, too. Dude, it's just so much stuff down there, man. And so many tubes and whatever, mm -hmm. and more pumps to maintain. And like, and, then, and like, if my dosing pump breaks, it's usually gonna break off. It's yeah. just gonna stop dosing, the tube's gonna stop working, the motor's gonna stop working. In this case, if things stop working on the uh, calcium reactor and you're not paying attention, it can go bad in a variety of ways that you don't want, you know? So it's just more gear. It now, is. there is a point where I would use it. You know what the point is? Cost. Yeah, two part got too expensive. Whatever that sentence is for you uh, is where you should switch to a calcium reactor, man. Mm -hmm. uh, two part got too expensive. I, I don't know where that magical number is for anybody, but uh, I would actually resist the gear junkie in this case because you, know, you could easily spend a thousand bucks on setting up a calcium reactor. Yeah. It, I Personally, I feel like a 200 gallon tank is a little bit on the expensive side to run two part. Yeah, probably. A uh, 200 gallon tank, uh, yeah. You know, I'm on the 360. I'm gonna, be, I'm gonna pay attention to this actually. Cause on, on the 360, we're running that uh, Triton stuff, predominantly cause we have a refugium. Uh, and that's like about middle of the cost in terms of two parts out there. Uh, a, you know, you, I was surprised when we actually did the math on it because it's kind of represented as the highest, most expensive kind of stuff, but it was actually middle of the pack. Really? Uh, I know, isn't it surprising? <laughs> uh, uh, we were measuring as cost per, you know, part per million calcium added and cost per uh, alkalinity added, and that's where it came out. Uh, but I'm going to pay attention to what it costs because I guess it's possible I might change it, you know, but. That is the only point I would use it is, it is too damn expensive for me to use two-part now. I need to figure out something else. Potentially you're using so much two-part that you're having salinity issues as well. True. Yeah. It's probably what, 150 mils of each right. daily? Three minutes, see what, we get else. what else we can get in here. Chorus rasses. So I have chorus rasses in there to eat uh, a lot of the, like, you know, different parasites and stuff that are in the tank, like, uh, you know, spiders, flatworms, anything that's small and move and makes me mad. <laughs> uh, all right, so it says here, uh, chorus rest is really, did you mean helichorus? It's not the same. Yeah, helichorus are just the, your melanaris group for yep. the most part. Um, what do we need to know about them? They, they eat the stuff, they go in the sand, they're gonna eat your inverts if you put them in there. Yep, so the, the message here is like, everybody's got like a, like a favorite. You know, some people really love the helichorus rash for this uh, purpose. Uh, I, I use it too, works just fine. Uh, Pseudo Kalinus is yeah. good. You know what's cheap? It's a yellow chorus ras and a green chorus ras, and they've worked really well for me. They work for you? Yeah, of course. Yeah, these are really inexpensive, and I'll be honest, man, that bright yellow fish is cool. I like it. You know, it brings like movement to it, and I even like the little like kind of paler green one as well. And and they they form that real super male in a harem with mm. the orange face. Nice looking fish. They jump. Yeah. Let's put a hit on, I'll put a lid on for sure. Uh, okay. Uh, I don't think see, I've seen BRS talk about when you want to mount a radion normally versus turning it long ways. I'd love to know the advantages, disadvantages of the situations that justify the different uh, changing orientation. Meaning, you know, most of the time you see them in the package and they're like kind of long ways on the tank. When do we turn them this way? Because the only way you ever heard me talk about it is this way, right? When do you do them this way? I don't know that there's a difference. Okay, so for me, it is, okay, I'm gonna add a third one in. If I was gonna do two, I'd probably do them long ways. But I'm gonna add a third one in to concentrate the light. Well, now I'm gonna turn them sideways because I actually want more to, to distribute light wider, the value of getting closer to the glass and wider out in front of the scape rather just an over the top of the middle one is, you know, I'm distributing light further. And so if I had three, you know, two, I obviously don't want to do that. I'm going to have a dark spot in the middle, right? If I have three and I'm going to close, I'm going to, or better than saying three, if I'm going to space them, 
you know, 14 to 18 inches apart, I'm gonna turn them front to back, uh, and then I get better coverage of the whole tank. If I'm gonna space them to two feet, I'm gonna do this. Does that sound about right? Yeah, I just don't use the back or the front of the tank much. So any, for, the, for, the, for lack of better terms, I always run them parallel with the back of the tank. Okay, so for me, when I'm looking at this, if you actually look down at where it's illuminating, like for the most people's aquascapes kind of like about in the middle of the tank these days so what you're doing is like eliminating just the top of this aquascape really well and what you're not really getting is like you know direct photons hitting down you know over the front where the corals are so if i turn it sideways now that piece of it that was over just the middle of the aquascape is kind of hanging out over mm. the front and you're getting you know angle of incidence of photons hitting the corals that are on the front of the tank now, one of the ways you could do that, though, is the same way you talked about it. Let's just move the whole bar of lights forward because mm -hmm. I don't really need to light the back of the tank all that much unless it's creating a visually unappealing appeal, uh, like look to it. Well, the moral of the story is you have one perspective, I have, a, I have the other, and I don't think they're really vastly different. I, I, will it dramatically change your results? No. Yeah, probably not. It would, uh, do most of us in here want to optimize for the best possible thing that we could do with the, the equipment we bought? Yeah. Probably. So if I was doing that, I'd probably do it that way. One of the things, though, that also some people do is they take the lights and they move them forward and then they angle them like this. Mm -hmm. And you know the reason why they do that? Is they're getting them to grow the corals towards the pane of glass on the front, not towards the top. Because everybody knows the look down. They grow towards the light and the look down is the coolest part we see the most coral color. So if you can actually shift the way that those corals grow and get them to grow angled towards the pane of glass, you're gonna get a much better uh, visual display in the tank. Our 1500 gallon tank, we have angled like that. I don't know if you remember that or not, but the refraction of light created a haze on the front panel, and that's why we did that. So you can also get the glass to the the photons to reflect off the glass and create that angle of incidence. So did you you, you created a haze? You solved the haze by reflecting like that? Correct. Oh, because the the tank has a euro brace and it's it's bouncing around inside the end of the glass panel. All right, that is it. We've been an hour. We made it through 31 of these things. Not too bad. Wow. There are a handful of other questions. Ask them in the comments in these videos and we will do our best to answer them. Thank you for everybody joining us. Uh, there is... Stick around for one minute. If you're on YouTube, uh, stick around for the next click because uh, John from uh, Coral Media is joining us. I've got 17 questions about maintaining clams because I don't know anything about it. Uh, and he's gonna tell me every single thing that he knows about maintaining clams in an aquarium. And if you wanna know what they are, uh, you guys here will find out about it in about two minutes. Uh, you guys, we'll see you next on YouTube. Awesome, thanks.